Hey guys, this is uh, Richard Scruggs. He's a CEO, a biotech CEO here in Houston. Uh, currently CEO of Rescue Therapeutics. He's had an amazing career from uh, undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. Right. Um, various other startup companies uh, and a lot of success as, a, as an entrepreneur. Uh, but first was a consultant before that made a leap from consulting to starting his own company. So going from a very secure lifestyle and, and paycheck to who knows what will happen, but you know, essentially uh, eating what he kills. He's going to talk to you guys for a few minutes today about his story. And uh, you know, it's pretty informal, so just interrupt with questions as you have them. But you know, this is the idea is to get away a little bit from engineering at times and just talk about you know, where does engineering go? And it goes to entrepreneurship, it goes to creating your own companies and building things that weren't there before. So we're just going to share with you his story as to exactly how he's done that. Good. Well, thank you. I'm glad you didn't help me sell this to my wife when I, <laughs> when I left consulting to start the company. Well, I, I appreciate the chance to be here with you guys, and, and I think uh, what you're doing is it's pretty incredible and a great opportunity, so I hope you're enjoying it. And this is interesting for me because my I just saw my daughter's picture in the hallway down there, so if you go to the last, get to the stairwell, right before the stairwell, there's a class of 2012, my daughter, you can find her picture there. She graduated here a year ago. So it's the first time I've been back here in a, in a while, and uh, I spoke to the entrepreneurship class here right across the hall not too long ago. So. I enjoy doing it. I thought I would do just what Robin said, tell you about my background, because when I, I look back on it, I, I, my career has taken these twists and turns, and it's not ever what I thought it would be, <coughs> excuse me, when I was in high school probably, or certainly when I was in college. Uh, but it's turned out pretty well. I've, I've enjoyed it, uh, and I can tell you honestly, I've never had a bad job, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed what I've done all the way along. Uh, so I'll tell you my story, and any questions you guys have along the way of why we did what we did or you know, how it worked out, I'll, I'll be very open and tell you the good and the bad as we've done it. So I, I grew up here in town in Pasadena. I uh, went to Pasadena High School and was the son of a father who was a mechanical engineer. And so I was always around engineering in one way or another, not to the detail that you guys are here. But, uh, but I had a father with a technical degree, and, and I, I knew something about what he did. He built chemical plants. Uh, and when I was in college, he spent most of my college career living in Algeria, where he helped build a liquefied natural gas plant. He was a project manager on that. But a couple things stuck with me as I was in high school. I watched my dad, who had a master's degree in engineering, as well as a BS, uh, go to night school at the University of Houston and take business classes. And I would talk to him about why he did that. And he said, well, if we're, we're building these hundreds of millions of dollars of plants, which today's economy probably billion dollar plants. We're building those, and as a project manager, I'm talking to engineers one day about some boiler specifications, some heat exchanger specifications, but the next day I'm talking to the Bank of Japan about how we're gonna finance this, and I'm talking to a Korean manufacturing company about how they're going to build it, and a Singapore-based shipping company and he said, I've got to understand business. And so I watched him as the father of six kids who was a Sunday school teacher and a Boy Scout troop leader and worked a full-time job, go to night school at U of H. And that made a real, real impression on me as a, as a kid. And so I realized probably then that while I was interested, I, I, liked, I did well in chemistry, I did well in physics classes in high school, I liked those topics. Um, and they got my attention, but I understood from watching my dad that I probably needed to be a little more well-rounded, and uh, so I did that. So I went off to uh, Texas A&M, got my undergrad in chemical engineering there, thinking I would go to work for an oil company. That's what all engineers, chemical engineers in the 1970s were taught to do, to go work for an oil company or a refinery, chemical plant. That was where I thought my career was headed. Uh, along the way, I decided to, to get an advanced degree in engineering. I thought I wanted to actually get a doctorate in engineering. And so I was applied to that program and uh, literally the day before school started, grad school started, I, I just called time out and I, I talked to my dad and I said, I don't want another chemistry class, I don't want another engineering class, what I'm really in this for is, is I want to learn more about the other issues. And so I literally walked across campus the day before school started and said to the business school, can I get an MBA? Today, a student on a, any major campus in the United States could not do that. The MBA schools would say no. But, but in 1979, the MBA school at Texas A&M was very small, and they were probably a little more flexible. 
and I talked my way into the MBA program. So I graduated in 1979 with an undergrad in chemical engineering and a master's in business. Um, still, when I started my MBA, I uh, thought that I would go to work for an oil company. I really did, and, and that was my whole focus. But I had a professor who I got to know, and I would encourage you as you think about it, not just going finishing through high school, but, but as you get into college, is to meet these professors. And so one of the, the girl on the photo down here, one of the hard things I've had teaching her is that, as she's off at college now, is, is that these professors, you can talk to them as, as people, and they don't look down on you because you're a freshman, you know, and you don't know anything about this class yet. And, and so I've really encouraged her to get to know these profs and, and meet them as people, and because it'll help them in the long run. And I did that MBA program, and I had a prof come to me uh, as I was finishing the first year of the MBA program, he said, Richard, uh, you can do what you think you're going to do, and you, you may do well at it. He said, but I think you ought to look at, at this career in information technology. And by this point, I said, well, you know, I've had one two-hour class of programming. I program Fortran, which nobody does, did anymore back in that time, and they don't certainly do it today. And he said, well, you missed the point. He said, what, what these people need who are building technologies is they need people who understand um, why something's useful, how it's going to be employed, not just how to build it. You got a lot of people with the technical skills, but why is this important? Why is, uh, you know, a, 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 uh, a voice-activated remote control interesting? Why is why is the art that you could do with your with your LEDs? Why are the wind turbines? Uh, how could the the technologies in y'all's robot, uh, you know, be adapted to to business? or you know, industry needs, uh, whether they're true for-profit industry or even you know, not for-profit. He says, you get, they got to understand that. And he says, you, you've got this technical and, and business background. And so I agreed to interview with one of these companies, and I did. And I, I did it, uh, it was the first interview I had, and I said, well, I'm going to practice on these guys. I'll practice my interview, and I'll get it right so that when I talk to Exxon, Shell, Texaco, all the other oil companies at the time, I'll be prepared, and I'll go be a great engineer. And what happened to me was that these guys opened my eyes to something completely different. And it was how do you put, take information technology and solve business problems with it? And what's the role of somebody who could sit between the businessmen and women, uh, whether they were in accounting or they're in, in engineering or they were in uh, the land department of an oil company or they were you know, in, in the laboratory? How do you sit between those people and the people who understand how to make the computers hum and make the two work together so we solve their business problems. And, and so I got into the consulting world. And uh, after all those interviews and in oil companies, I kept saying, I like that first one better, I like that first one better. And I took it, it was my lowest paid job offer at the time. And, and my dad said, you know, how did that work out for you? You paid your way through grad school and you took the lowest offer. <laughs> Which was actually less than I could have been paid as an engineer two years earlier. <laughs> but but it, it worked out pretty well, and, I, and so I ended up spending about 10 years working for a very large consulting company that today is known as Accenture, if you ever look them up. Very large, uh, well-known around the world, uh, and because I had a chemical engineering degree, I started working with oil and gas clients, and I worked for 10 years doing that. Started off doing technical things, coding programs, <laughs> that kind of thing, ultimately helped me listen to a client and say, this is my problem. You, Think about uh, you think about any of these refineries, say out on the ship channel, that you've probably driven by at one time. Somewhere oil gets to that refinery so they can refine it. But somewhere, if you, if you really think back, there's this long network of pipes that just keeps exploding into this network that finally gets to wells in the ground. And every one of those wells are owned by different people and they have different economic interests. And one of the big challenges is where does that oil come from and who gets paid for it? We became very good at, at that allocation system. And, it, and so my engineering thinking about how to break down a problem and, and, and do that, and, and mass balances and understanding that what goes in the system has to come out at the other end, uh, be, came into play. And so I was able to sit between the accountants who had to account for this and pay people for it, and the engineers who had to produce it and, and work with it. And I became known uh, in, in that, in Accenture's business, a guy who really understood oil and doesn't sound very exciting, I know, but oil and gas uh, accounting and, and uh, what's called allocations, and actually developed a reputation for doing that. So it was interesting, and I, I enjoyed it. I got to meet a ton of people. I, I traveled all over the country doing it. 
uh, worked with some very interesting companies. I, I got to cross a picket line uh, when, when uh, some folks were striking at a client and we had to get a, a system started and I actually helped drag stuff off of trucks across a picket line. Um, but uh, did what I had to do to, to do it. In about 1990, a friend came to me and said, I've started a small company. We want to, to do what you've been doing the last few years on big mainframe computers on PCs. And he had about 50 employees. And he said, I need somebody that understands the business and can help us sell work to clients. And I thought I could do it. It sounded a challenge. And I left the safety of the big world of where you know, there were tens of thousands of people in this company, and I had a steady paycheck, and I had benefits, and I had health care for my family, and whatever, I left that to go to work for a 50-person company that sometimes had trouble making payroll. And we took that company, though, over the next few years from an office in Greenway Plaza here, uh, 50 people, to 10 offices around the country, 650 people, and we were acquired by an Atlanta-based company in 1996 for $450 million. Now, I was not the founder of that company. I was not a large shareholder of that company. I was a small shareholder in that company. But the founder of that company um, ended up making, you know, he probably pulled out $100 million himself. And his investors pulled out some money. And I thought, you know, it's an interesting thing. He, he, uh, he did a really good job. He, he built a valuable business that people that gave great jobs to people that served clients and, and created value for clients and ultimately somebody paid him for it. And I thought it sounded like a lot of fun. Uh, so in 96, when we were bought, I didn't want to go with the company that, was bought, that had bought us. It was not my interest to go back to work for a giant company. And I had an idea in 1996 that was novel that you would not think is novel today. And that is that using the internet, you can do real business transactions. In 1996, you couldn't buy this shirt online. You couldn't turn in your homework online. You couldn't download music online. You couldn't book an airline reservation online in 1996. Uh, most homes probably didn't have a real decent internet connection, and, and uh, web browsers were not what they were today. But, but me and a group of friends who had been in this business for a while put our head together and said, where is technology going? And it was clearly going towards the internet. Uh, and uh, we said, we watched PCs take over that world and local area networks. We said it's going to happen. And so we formed a company here in Houston in 1996 called Align Solutions. Uh, ten people on day one. We brought ten friends together, not friends, ten coworkers. Uh, some of us, I was the only one who knew all ten. The others didn't necessarily know each other. Uh, some did, some didn't. And we started with ten people around a table, seven women and no, three women and seven guys, and we put it together. And we went in three years, we went from zero to 250 people. We had offices in Houston, Dallas. Uh, Houston and Dallas were the main offices. We had a couple small outposts in Denver and St. Louis and Atlanta with two to five people in each of those locations. Uh, we did about $27 million of revenue in our third year of business, which was tremendous. I got my picture on the front page of the Houston Business Journal. Uh, as running the fastest growing company in the area. Um, so it was a very exciting time. And at the end of the year, we got bought. Uh, we, we actually uh, were approached by a group who was trying to take companies like ours around the country and roll them together into a bigger company. Uh, before I tell you about that, I will tell you what we did. I mean, we, we built systems that, uh, so which you would never see. <clears throat> so for example, Enron, you remember the name Enron, but Enron and a couple other pipeline companies uh, control their pipeline on a minute by minute, hour by hour basis. We built some intranet sites to allow everybody within the company to see what's going on in the pipes and, and where gas is flowing and where there's an outage, where there's a problem. Uh, if there was an explosion in Chevron of refinery, somebody went to an intranet system to look for the safety procedures, the disaster recovery procedures, that's on a system. But things that you might see is you decided tonight to make a reservation at the Hilton Hotel in, in Manhattan because you're going to fly up there tomorrow morning. And when you get there, you want to make sure your hotel reservation is there. And you gave your credit card number to them. You want to make sure that it's, that it's safe. Um, that's a system we built the first version of in, in the mid-90s, late 90s. It's been replaced since then, but we built that. If you decide, I don't want to go to the Hilton in Manhattan. I want to go to the Bahamas. I want to fly on American Airlines vacations. 
and I want to get the American Airlines vacation package that includes the hotel and the airfare and, and two you know, days of scuba diving, that's a system for American Airlines vacations that we built in the late 90s since been replaced. So we did things that were consumer facing. Uh, we ultimately helped build the system that if you want to custom mix your own bag of 40 pound bag of M&Ms, your own favorite colors, so your rice guys can get some blue and gray ones and some Aggies can put some blue and you know, some maroon and white ones together and whatever, the Westbury folks here can put their yellow and gold ones, or gold and blue ones together. Uh, that's the system we built, so you can order them online and have them shipped to you. A lot of those in the 90s have been replaced. But those, so we did consumer facing things, we did things that consumers would never see. In 99, we were approached by a group that wanted to roll companies together like ours. We did that. We took it public. I was on the team that did that. If you've heard about public companies selling stock to the general public, uh, we did that. I was on the team that traveled around the country selling stock uh, to big uh, investment bankers and pension funds and people with money. Um, we, it was a very exciting time. We went public. Uh, I ultimately became head of sales for a 1,000-person company then that we created out of that. Um, ran it for two years, um, and then the bottom fell out. Um, we so I, so I built company. I built companies, and, we, and you know, getting up to a thousand, twelve hundred people that was exciting. But I'll tell you, I took them through bankruptcy. Also, that company that we built on the morning of September 11th. It, you guys remember September 11th? You're too young to remember it as strongly as I do. Uh, but on the morning of September 11th, our largest client was American Airlines. It lost two planes. Our eighth largest client was United Airlines that lost two airplanes. Our newest project was in the World Trade Center. And fortunately, I had no staff there that day, but that project would start the next day, next week, if, it, if the Trade Center had still been there. Uh, our New York office was just on the edge of the zone that was closed after the incident. Uh, our New York office was really out of commission for about two weeks. Uh, American Airlines and United Airlines both stopped their projects immediately. You couldn't blame them. Uh, and then, to make matters worse, that's two of our top ten clients, number one and number eight. Our number two client was a little company called Enron that filed bankruptcy about 45 days later. So this was a healthy company that was actually producing positive cash flow, that was growing, that had a number of clients, the name brand clients that you would have loved, like American Airlines and Aon Insurance and, and m and Mars and the Arts and Entertainment Network on TV was a client. Uh, but in a matter of 45 days, we went from being profitable to bankrupt because of the events of 9-11 and the Enron disaster. Uh, put us out of business. Uh, so uh, I know I'm rambling on, but this is my career. So, so it kind of got to that point. I woke up, literally woke up on the morning of January 1, 2002, unemployed, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, decided that I uh, wasn't ready to go back to work for a, a big company. I didn't have a good idea for a startup. Time, so I took a year off, watched my two daughters play uh, volleyball and field hockey at their schools and be in their choir concerts. Um, I took, decided I wanted to do something for my non-engineering side of my brain, so I took a year of watercolor painting lessons because uh, I really wanted to exercise the other side of my brain. Uh, and I spent the time just talking to a number of companies about what, and entrepreneurs about what they're doing and what the needs are and what the opportunities are. Through that effort, um, in about, that was 2002, in late 2003, Texas A&M came to me and said, would you run the Entrepreneurship Center in our business school? So I started commuting to College Station 90 miles uh, for four years. I did this a uh, couple days a week, three days a week. I was in academia. So I started out in information technology, doing the work, then managing the work and growing companies. And, and taking one public, and then I switched to academia, so kind of second career, where I would advise professors uh, who invented products on how to commercialize them, whether they were in the vet school and they had a new, more nutritious dog bone, believe it or dog biscuit. I, I actually had that conversation, or it was the guy with the lasers who was using lasers to uh, measure the amount of combustible gas at the top of a structure like a warehouse or something. And uh, so I'd, I'd have very technical conversations one day with the engineering prof with the lasers, and the next day I'd be talking to people about what are, what's the recipe for a nutritious dog biscuit, you know, whatever it was. So I'd talk to them, I'd talk to students, maybe like you, uh, or their undergraduate students or grad students who wanted to commercialize their, their technology and wanted to start a business around it. 
and so we talk about it and uh, and became good friends with a lot of students and to this day I still coach and mentor some of those students I had a conversation last week with one who just left to go to China to start a business development deal trying to take technology transfer from the state from the states to China and so it's kind of exciting to see these guys and gals grow and do that so I did that for four years uh, along the way, a business partner and I did consulting to young companies, so we, we helped young companies think about business plans, and uh, we decided to buy a small business that we could operate on the side. And so today I own about, with a friend, I own about 600 acres of grass on the far side of town, uh, the east side of town in Crosby. So I'm a grass dealer, is what I tell people. Uh, you got to understand what, what kind of grass it is, uh, but but uh, for since 2003 we've owned and operated. Well, we owned a grass farm. We gave up operations of it a year ago to our farm manager, turned it over to him, and we just we run the land and, and we lease the land out. So I've had a stint in agriculture for the last six years, also. Uh, not where I thought I'd be, being a city boy growing up in Houston. Not think I'd be in agriculture ever. Uh, I married a girl whose family were farmers, and when they met me, they said, don't ever go into farming, you're crazy, if you ever think about it, and I ended up owning a farm. Uh, so I didn't listen. But uh, but it's been an interesting business, and I've learned how to deal uh, with, with the workforce that works around a farm, um, and, and dealing with customers, and the fact that in a, in a farm like that, uh, you think about customer service, you guys go to a store, or you call them on, on the phone, and talk to somebody, customer service is important to you, and our, our customer service is the truck driver, and, and you learn very quickly that that man who's driving the truck is the most important person to our customers, and so you, you find the right people that can do it. Uh, and then, ultimately, through my work at A&M, uh, I got involved in a drug startup, and so I became a drug dealer and a grass dealer, so I'm pretty popular. Um, but drug deal, the drug deal is that uh, the first one, uh, Robin mentioned one that doing, but I'm also working on a second one. We started in 2007 a product uh, that was discovered at Texas A&M um, that's an all-natural product that can mitigate severe diarrhea. And that doesn't sound like a real exciting topic, uh, but, it, but it's not like you have a bad meal today and you can't come in tomorrow to, to class and the you know, day after tomorrow you feel better and you kind of come in and make it through half a day. We're not talking about that. We're talking about chemotherapy patients who get a lot of cancer drugs, a lot of toxic drugs. You you know people or heard about people who go through cancer therapy and their hair falls out or they're fatigued, they don't have an appetite. What people don't talk about is that diarrhea is really a big problem because you can't keep your nutrients in. And if you can't keep your nutrients in, you can't stay hydrated, they can't give you chemotherapy. And if you can't get chemotherapy, you can't progress on your cancer treatment. So for the last six years, we've been working on this drug. We just finished treating 100 colorectal cancer patients. Uh, the trial had kind of so-so results. We, we showed that the drug is very safe, but we didn't show that it's as, it has as much what's called efficacy. It's not as effective as we hoped it would be. We're trying to figure out how to salvage that situation. Uh, but that's one of the things I've been working on. And I promise you, when I was in your shoes in high school, I hated biology. I absolutely did not like biology. I loved chemistry. I loved physics. I tolerated math, but I just didn't like biology. And, and Mr. Logan knows that. He, he was my teacher in high school. And, and so when I went to A&M, I had to take a, a, a class. I had to take, a, in chemical engineering, a non-chemistry, non-physics elective. I had to be a science elective. And most of the guys that I was with were taking biology, and I just didn't want to do it. So I went over and took geology, because I had an interest in I, I, I liked to camp. I liked to hike. I liked to get outdoors. So geology was kind of interesting to me. So I took it. Now you fast forward 30 years and I'm sitting talking to doctors about how the GI tract works. And I really wish I'd learned a little bit more. <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. So today I'm actually running two drug companies. I'm running one that just finished what's called a phase two trial in 100 colorectal cancer patients. And we also just finished a study in dogs. Dogs get, col uh, don't get colorectal cancer. Dogs get cancer, they get lymphoma, leukemia, uh, and other, other cancers. And about 90,000 dogs a year get chemotherapy. And if we can make that process better, we can save those dogs, we can save some human beings. So we've been doing that and uh, working on how to salvage that situation. And then secondly, my most recent startup, the one that Robin and I've talked most about, is that some other professors at A&M have uh, 
identified a compound that if you have an oncology patient, a cancer patient taking a chemotherapy, you, you, you may know somebody in your family or your neighborhood, somebody who's had cancer and they thought that they were cured and two years later, three years later it comes back. And that's called recurrence and, and what really happens is if, they, if that person had a tumor the size of my fist, the chemotherapy and the radiation maybe kills everything but something the size of my little finger. And so they feel better, they maybe can't even see this on an x-ray, um, they feel better, but what happens is these were the most resilient cells, the most resistant cells to chemo, and over time they start growing back. And when they grow back, what grows back? The strongest, most nasty cells, and now you have a tumor the size of my fist that's made up all of those nasty cells. What the folks at A&M have found is a single drug that you add to the chemotherapy that will kill little finger and so we get down to maybe nothing left or maybe something the size of my fingernail or something and what we're hoping is that it will extend the life for these these cancer patients we're going to start testing in spring next year testing ovarian cancer patients so ovarian cancer uh, initial treatment is fairly good but for those women who relapse it's pretty bad and it deteriorates very quickly we think we can change that equation I just uh, got off the phone and spent just an hour with a VC, a venture capitalist this morning, talking to them about the idea of, of how they could fund it. Question? Uh, how fast would that, uh, would, would, you know, you know how you said uh, the strongest cells, how fast would they, would they grow back? They, they actually grow back fairly quickly. It, it depends on the cancers. Um, but in ovarian cancer, they can be very aggressive. A woman who, I mean, this is terrible, and I don't want to scare anybody who may meet somebody got ovarian cancer at some point, but a sec what's called a second line ovarian cancer patient, so somebody who's gone through the first round of treatment with, with the, the standard uh, treatment, which is surgery and then chemo, uh, when she relapses, she's got a life expectancy that's less than 12 months at that point. Now, and that relapse will happen usually within two years. So that, that will start growing back in 12 to 24 months. It will be big enough that is noticeable in her health and on her exams. And, and so and that's fairly fast. Uh, you take other cancers that are slower growing. Uh, one of the ones we've studied a lot is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which was actually the genesis of this whole project because a man in the, that's a, that was one of the inventors lost his wife to this disease. Uh, it, it takes longer to grow back. So you, you, once you do, once it does, it's pretty aggressive, but it takes longer. So. Uh, it, it's been an interesting, interesting thing. It, it can be very quick, very quick. And so, you know, the, these are the kinds of interesting problems we're working on right now that, that can have a direct impact on somebody's life. You know, and, and so when I, when I look at my career, I say, well, yeah, when I was where you are, I'm not sure how much I really thought about a career, but I, but I understood my interest lied more in chemistry and physics, say, than it did in uh, the biology side that I was more of a science type person than I was uh, liberal arts, uh, English, you know, literature and those kinds of things. Uh, I knew where my interests lied and, 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 you know, probably influenced by my dad and, and that. But, but so I, I made sure I took chemistry too. I took physics too in high school and, and, I, and I got into a good engineering school here in the state. Uh, and so I, I had that path in mind, but I really didn't know what I was going to do with it. Then as I got into it, okay, oil companies refining, that was probably where you were going to go. Now today, I went back and actually saw the man who taught me thermodynamics. He was, when I went to work at Texas A&M, he was the head of the engineering, of the chemical engineering department. I went back and saw Dr. Hall. And he remembered me because I fell asleep in his class one day and he threw a piece of chalk across the room and hit me in the head and woke me up. And uh, he said he had to quit doing that because next year somebody's head bobbed and he hit the woman behind the student he was aiming at. He had to stop throwing chalk. So he still he remembered me. And that was what he remembered. Yeah. The other thing people remember before at A&M is for being arrested in class on the first day of my MBA school. I can tell you about that too. I got arrested. Um, it was exciting. Uh, but but to where were we? So so but today chemical engineers. I, I talked to Dr. Hall. I said Dr. Hall. When I was here, you taught us to, to go to work for a refinery, a petrochemical company, an oil company. What would, you, what would students do today? He said, well, they certainly do that. He said, but they might go to work for Frito-Lay. You think about making a potato chip or making a, a Cheeto, that's a chemical process. That's a, chemical, that's a process to begin with. I mean, 
go home and bake a cake tonight. That's a process. It's, there's a certain recipe. If you don't put the ingredients together in the right process, in the right way, in the right timing, and, and you don't, you know, cook it at the right temperature for the right length of time, and you don't let it cool off before you take it out of the pan, you screw it up. And and, and so making a Cheeto, making a Frito, making a Dorito is a process <laughs> like that. And, and so chemical engineers go in that world. Making a, a, a drug, chemical engineers go into drug development. Um, you know, we're making this drug on a workbench like this, and we can make it in two gram quantities pretty easy and fairly pure, or maybe like in that hood back there. Uh, but but when when somebody else wants to take this drug and we want to actually start putting it patients out, you know, when it's commercialized, making two grams at a time is not the way to go. We're going to make, you know, 100 gram batches, 300 gram batches. So the question is, can you scale this process from hood size over there to a big process? And the first time we did it, we ended up with a lot more impurities in the drug, and we had to back up and say, do we have the recipe right? Do we have the scaling right? And that was just going from two grams to 20 grams. Forget going to 200 grams or 2,000 grams. So, um, you know, I didn't realize that when I was in school. But, you know, that you, you can go so many ways with, with these tech, technical, <coughs> technical background. So I, I, I uh, you won't have it all figured out, and I didn't have it figured out, but, but I believed that I was getting a good background. And so I, I did the technical stuff, I mean, the engineering stuff in school, and I worked summer jobs. I did information technology, I did agriculture, I did academia, and now I'm doing bioscience, and my career has just taken these weird turns. And I think the technical underpinning has been a big part of it, and I'll tell you, I've preached that to my two girls. Uh, my oldest daughter, um, graduated with a biomedical engineering degree last May, and now she's in law school here in town. She thinks she wants to be intellectual property law. And the point I always made to her was if you get that technical degree, you get that technical underpinning, you can always go less technical and you can do a lot of other things. But you can't go get a Russian literature degree and then decide, I want to go to med school, <laughs> you know, without taking a big step backwards and going technical again. So I think you guys, are, if you've got an interest in the area you're working in, it, it <coughs> forms a great foundation for whatever you're going to do down the road. And the thing that's been key to me, I think, is is being open-minded. I, I was always willing to listen. I was willing to consider different ideas. So when this professor approached me about this consulting thing, I said, listen to him. One, I recognized he was smarter than I was, and he he'd seen many more students than, than just me come through that place, and he had an idea. And, I, and I, so I went into it with an open mind, and I listened to the people in the interview, and I, I objectively evaluated it compared to my well company offers, and, and ultimately made what in hindsight I think was absolutely the right decision. Uh, going into drug development was not something I planned, but it was kind of putting myself at the right place in the right time. And that's the other thing I would tell you, is that not only be open-minded about what you might do and get a good technical, or get a good underpinning for it, but to put yourself out there. And, and, and to talk to people and be involved in things. So whether you go to college, get involved with things outside of uh, what you're necessarily in your major. Uh, when you when you get out of school, ultimately, and you're in the work world, and you maybe starting a family, get out and get involved and listen to what you what your next door neighbor does. Maybe you're in, in refining and he's in biotech, and he says, you know, here's the problem. In fact, I, I've got a good example of a guy here in town who made a name as as a He's a PhD physicist who made a name for being able to measure complex things down hole when they drill a well. So you're going down thousands of feet, miles into the earth, into a pretty nasty environment, and they have to measure temperatures and pressures and other things um, in, in real time and, and get you know accurate readings and repeatable readings, and they make decisions on, on the well that are, that are multi-million dollar decisions based on that kind of data, right? So this this true story, he's having a cookout in his backyard with the neighbors, and one of the neighbors is a carpal tunnel sur surgeon. And, he, and he's talking about how they do surgery on carpal tunnel and how they diagnose it. And he's talking about the way you diagnose carpal tunnel is you put a needle in your arm here and a needle in your palm, and you run an electric current through your arm, and they watch how long it takes to get from point A to point B. But doesn't that sound painful to you? <laughs> <laughs> None of, you got some electronic stuff here, and you don't, neither one of you, none of you want to stick. So, start, so the business starts asking questions, right? And, and he and he said, and what, and what happens when you have carpal tunnel is if I told my hand, squeeze this 
this marker, the signal goes from here to here. It, two different nerves take it to each of these two fingers. These two fingers. It's hard for an Aggie to do this, by the way. <laughs> so so the, the signal gets to these two fingers from a different nerve. And when that one of those nerves is compressed, the signal gets there slower. Very, it's you couldn't tell it if I had carpal tunnel squeeze this. I could pick up a glass of water, full glass of water, heavy, and I would drop it. But what this guy figured out was that you could measure that time. So what he did is he invented something that's about this size. And I, I told you it was about the size of a roll of quarters, but it's, it's about this size, connected to a computer like this. And it's and where these three fingers are. There are three load cells. And, and where you put pressure on it. So you sit in front of a computer, connect it, and the computer would come up and say squeeze, and squeeze, and you hold it for however many seconds he has you hold it. And then he says relax, and you're supposed to relax to where, I just relaxed my hand, but there's enough pressure there to drop, not drop it. And this thing's actually as heavy as a roll of quarters, so the instrument would fall pretty quick. So you go through the squeeze, release, squeeze, release for 60 seconds, and then you do the other hand. And you bump it like that. You do the other hand, right? He could minutely measure the difference in time, that how fast that signal gets to this finger versus this finger. And you do this repeated test. And now surgeons are actually making a surgery decision based not on sticking needles in people's arms. But now, now I will also tell you this physicist is fighting the business guys. And um, it's going, it's rolling out much slower than it could. But uh, it's just, it, it was him listening, knowing what he knew, and listening to the problems, and let's think about it a different way, and being open-minded. So this guy went from working in oil field services to starting his own company in the medical device world. And the other thing we've discovered for him is that the baseball pitcher has the same problem. So we've been te we tested a rice baseball player that came back from Tommy John surgery, and we can tell when he's fatiguing. So when he, when he came back from surgery and after he started his rehab, they would get him out on the football field at Rice Stadium and they'd put somebody standing on the goal line, like you'd be my catcher, you'd stand on the goal line, and I would stand only on the 10-yard line and we'd play catch for a few minutes and as my arm felt okay, I'd back up to the 20-yard line and the idea is to keep getting me back uh, even further than the pitcher mount typically is and throwing long tosses to her. And but we could, we could have him throw 10 measuring, throw 10 measuring, and we could see when he's fatigued. So one of the ideas is to actually talk to the baseball guys to say, okay, now you got a pitcher who, at the end of the sixth inning, should I send him back out in the seventh inning? What if I could put him on a machine in the dugout? And, and, and you know what? You're fatiguing. You're below your baseline. I'm, I'm calling in Robin to pitch the seventh inning. Oh, we'll be taken out. Oh, well, you're, you're out. Sit in the bench. Get some good rate. <laughs> you're making millions of dollars. Get some good rate. So, so um, it, it's, you know, what I've done, what that man's done in his career, it's really about a good underpinning, like you guys are getting and, and may continue to develop, being open-minded about where things may take us, listening to people, uh, looking for opportunities, and taking what you know and saying, you know what, what, what you're doing with this robotics, you guys, uh, how, do you, how do you apply that? I mean, it, a very easy example for that kind of thing is, is this work that goes on in police departments where they send in robotic, you know, robots in to, to a place that may have a fire hazard or explosion hazard or, or whatever where you don't want to send a human being uh, or out in the military. Those kinds of applications and be able to take those buttons and do a few more things with it or shoot, look at the Mars rover. I mean, those are the kinds of things that if you just sit and listen, okay, this is what I'm doing. How do I apply it to some problem? It's tremendous. And, and the same thing's true on the business side. When it, it was interesting when I, oh, I'll tell you one last story then we open. Oh, um, our drug for the anti-diarrhea drug um, is an oral capsule that you take. The chemotherapy you get is an injection. And we're sitting around a table at MD Anderson about as long as this one with about as many people around it. And everybody at that table except me, after their name on their business card, says comma MD or comma PhD and several other initials. They were experts in their field. And somebody said, well, wait a minute. The way your drug works, our drug absorbs the toxic agent, neutralizes it, the toxic agent that causes the diarrhea. We neutralize it. Uh, they said, well, wait a minute. The chemotherapy, it gets into the gut too, and, and you'll neutralize the chemotherapy. So they all threw up their hands and said, stop. 
you know, we got we got to go back and run some more studies before we allow you to treat human beings. We can't do this." And they got all wound up. And finally, I just called time out. I said, "Guys, stop! Just stop for a minute." As I understand it, our caps, our product's giving orally, right? Yeah. And you give an injection of chemotherapy, right? Yes. Okay. Our drug stays in the GI tract, is never absorbed. Your drug goes through the circulatory system and is metabolized by the liver and excreted through the bile duct. See, I never knew that kind of stuff in high school here. Excreted through the bile duct into the GI tract. And by the time it gets to the GI tract, it's done it's all its job. It's done all the chemo work it's going to do, right? Yeah. I said, well, okay, it's a simple thing. It's all, I mean, the drugs never come in contact until after they're the neat, after they're it's used, the chemo's used up, so it can't negatively impact it. It was just simple to me, looking at, the, looking at the two systems and saying the two systems never cross, it's a little bit of a mass balance, a little bit of whatever, is it just logic? And they all said, well, you know, you're right. Okay, good, well, then we went back on. You know, so we are back on the treating humans. <laughs> I went home, I told my wife, I said, look, if I'm diagnosed with cancer this afternoon, I'm not sure I want to go back and see those people, because they just relied on me uh, <laughs> to solve the problem. Uh, but but it's it's that putting that systemic thinking, systematic thinking, and, and taking what you've learned and applying it to other things, and, and that's what I've been doing. And the last thing I would tell you is is make sure along the way you, you I said get out and talk to people, but also develop those communication skills. I think I've seen way too many technical people who are really comfortable writing code or working on breadboards or or whatever who um, can't sell their idea to people and can't talk about it. And each of you could explain to me your idea, that's good, and you gotta keep developing that. Because if you can't explain it to others, it'll never get there. And I used to speak to the uh, inventions class at A&M, I tell them, you know, an invention in your laboratory notebook might say, might cure cancer, but it's worth absolutely zero if it stays in your lab notebook. If you can't get it out of your lab notebook and convince somebody to pay, to pay the bills to manu you know to test it, you can't convince some doctor to try it. You can't convince some patient to take it. Then it's worth zero. It's the greatest invention in the world. But it's worth zero. It's only helpful to mankind or makes money for you once it gets out of that book. And the only way that happens, unless you are just an absolute genius and you can do business and you're independently wealthy. If you got if you're a genius and you're independently wealthy, maybe you can do it. But otherwise, you're going to rely on guys like me and guys like Robin and facilities like University of Houston and Rice and figure out with MD Anderson. You gotta talk to them. You gotta speak it, you gotta write it. And I'll quit rambling. But what can I tell you? I mean I've done a bunch of different things. Yes sir. So why did you get arrested on the first Why did I get arrested on the first <laughs> The end of the story was a mistake. I was mistaken uh, somebody tried to cheat the system. So um, but I can't, I can't tell the story short. I'll tell you the long story. So, so I'm, I go to the very first day of graduate school. And it's like the first day you guys were in here. You don't really, you maybe knew one other person, but you don't really know the person. So imagine there's a knock on that door, and Robin goes out there, comes back in, and calls your name as you come outside. And outside are two cops, and ultimately they tell you something, and, and you're shaking. You'll get your books, you're going down to the police station. So I did that. So I, they called my name. And I was close enough, I was sitting close enough to the door, I could hear blah, 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 scrubs. And I had a brother who was a freshman on campus, so I thought maybe my brother had gotten hurt, they were looking for me, I didn't really know what it was. And I went outside and um, she said, uh, this lady said, the cop said, uh, can, you, can you tell us about the accident you were in last Friday morning over by Kyle Field Football Stadium? And I said, well, I was in no accident. She said, well, we have an eyewitness report that you were, that you left the scene of the accident. And I said, no. What an accident. So well, I have an eyewitness count you were, so we're, you're going to be taken to the police station. Go get your books. So I come back in and I'm tripping over everybody trying to get to them. And she walks in the room in front of all these other students and says, we're going to have to arrest Mr. Scruggs. He won't be back today. <laughs> and walks out. And I walk out. And, and, and you know, so the, the, the professor told me, this is the guy who ultimately became my friend and who gave me the advice. And we're still friends today. He said we canceled class at that point because we didn't know if you'd held up the 7-Eleven across the street, if you, you know, you, you axe murdered your roommate. We didn't know what you were arrested for. We didn't, know, we, we couldn't study statistics anymore, so we all, everybody went home. <laughs> so, so we get outside. She puts me in the cop car, and, and she sits next to me in the back seat. She says, "Sit. You can't 
front and she says, where is your car? I need to see your car. I need to assess the damage. So there's no damage to the car. She says, I need to see it. Well, I committed a sin that day. I was late to class and so I parked in a football coach's reserve parking spot. <laughs> which is not a good thing to do. <laughs> so, so I had to admit where my car was. It was over, stuck in this parking lot. It wasn't supposed to be in with a sign that said reserved for some coach. And, and so we went over there, and she examines the car, and there's no damage. She says, well, you got it fixed, huh? I said, no, I didn't get it fixed. There's no damage. <laughs> so we get back in the car, and we're going to the police station, which is on the edge of campus. And, and she says to the driver in the front seat, she says, call Greg Ball and tell him we found the man who hit his car and he should meet us at the police station. So uh, a little light bulb went off in my head and we were driving across campus and I see Greg Ball, who was a friend of mine, walking across campus. I said, have you ever met Greg Ball? She says, no. I said, well, that's him right there. And so as they stop and they roll the car, the window down, they say, are you Greg Ball? Yeah. Would you like a ride to the police station? Yeah. So he gets in the front seat, doesn't look back. So we're driving along, and she finally says, Greg, meet the guy who hit your car. Here's Richard. He turned around and said, Richard, hey, how you doing? What are you doing here? Well, I've been accused of hitting your car. And so uh, he tells the police, I'm not going to press charges. I'm going to let it go. We'll deal with this, just him and I. And, and the cop, that wasn't good enough for him. So they took me in and gave me a lecture for half an hour. My brother showed up, because my brother was pulled out of class and said that his brother had been arrested. My brother shows up at the police station. They gave me a lecture about how nice it was to have such a good friend that was going to let me handle this outside of the legal system. So I get out of the police station, and Greg is sitting there on a bench, and he starts laughing. And he says, you're not going to believe this. And so what had happened was I went to buy my books for the first day. This is not a short story. I went to buy my books for the first day of class, and the Kyle Field parking lot is right near the bookstore, and it was a pouring rain. And so. I'm pulling into the parking lot, and just rows, you know, rows of cars parked at an angle, and and there's this guy in a van sitting right here, and so to to get around, he wouldn't move, and so to get around him, I had to pull up real close to the first car parked there. So I pulled up, backed up, and went on around. The side of this car had been caved in in a previous accident. The guy in the van thought I did it, so he got out and left a note under, on the windshield that says, "A man with driving a white Ford with this license plate hit your car," and he drove off. So my good friend thought he'd collect the insurance money twice. And he already collected it once and thought since he had an eyewitness account that he could collect twice <laughs> and pay for his semester of school or something. I don't know. He was laughing. I'm like, no, this is not funny. So first of all, there's a room full of my new MBA students, literally the first day of class, they'd never met me in their life, who thinks I'm an axe murderer, you know. <laughs> And, and you're, you're setting me up for this thing. So to this day, we're really not good friends. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, my uh, it was an August afternoon because it was right at the start of the fall semester. My brother had run from his dorm. You know, and he'd like drip and sweat. And, okay, well, so they must see all my code. But, uh, so that's why I got arrested. But but I will tell you, when I went to work for A and M, 20 years later, at the first faculty meeting. That professor stands up and says, let me tell you about Mr. Scruggs. He got arrested in my class in 1978 or 77. So he knew. I'm, not, I'm, I'm famous. <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth. <laughs> yes, sir. So as a in studying engineering in a college, how do you like, balance your time out, like, how, uh, your everyday life? How did it look like? Or how did you manage to balance uh, You know, I, I think I was. Uh, unaware that it was supposed to be difficult. I just kind of went through it. Um, and it took a lot of hours at a time, sometimes and did it. But but it's, it's a very good question, a very important question. And I think there's a couple things you have to keep in mind as to what's driving you. And, and first of all, you're there to get the college degree, right? Because without that, it's, it's all wasted. So you, you do need to make sure you, you get through electrical, chemical, engineering, history, whatever it is you're studying, whatever your degree is, you've got to do that. But the other thing is to come out the other side of school equipped to do whatever's next for your life, whether that is go to work, whether that's go to graduate school. Um, and that work can be a for-profit or a not-for-profit kind of uh, job, but, but to do that, you probably need to be more well-rounded than just, you know, great at thermodynamics and electrical engineering and, and whatever. And so it's important to get out and, and to you know, 
join a couple of clubs, play a sport, do whatever it is that you you like to do. And, and I was, I mean, I'll tell you, in high school, I was not, I, I wasn't hardly in anything activities-wise. I was a Boy Scout, uh, but but it was hard for me to meet people. I was I was also a year younger. I started school a year early, so I was a year younger than everybody in my class. I was the last one to learn to drive. I was the last one to really date anybody. Uh, you know, I was always just a year behind everybody. So I, was, I did not come out of high school as Mr. Social. Uh, but, but in college, is something clicked, and I got into a group of folks that you know, I got involved in some things. And, you know, today I find myself, I, I, I years ago stood in front of the whole crowd at Miller Outdoor Theater and introduced the, the activity that night. I wouldn't have imagined myself as a high school kid standing in front of 10,000 people on the lawn at Miller Theater and talking into a microphone. Uh, but I, I kind of figured it out in college. And so uh, I, I think it's important to get out and get those activities and, and just you, you got to find the balance and you got to know, you know, what's important. And I'll tell you, when you get off to college, especially you go to a campus, you can go anywhere, you go to a campus the size of A&M, UT, any other big school around the country. There's a ton of stuff you can do, and there's no mom and dad sitting there saying, don't take on one more. I mean, you can get involved in this club and that club, and you can go on this trip with this group, and you can do that, and pretty soon you can figure out that you haven't been to history class in the last week, and, and you walk in, there's a test being given. Not that that would ever happen to me, like it did one day. I walk in and go, crap, there's a history test going on. Uh, but, so you gotta, you got to figure out a balance that, and it's just it's, it's a balance, you can figure out what that's right, but, but you you can't go one too far either way. You can't be too far insular and just focused on, on the academics, and you can't get over here to the detriment of the academics. And, and you got to find that happy balance, and, and you just have to be aware of it. And, and there are times you've got to be willing to tell your friends, I can't go do that, or I can't take on this activity in this club meeting because I do have a big thermal test on Friday. And boy, you know, going into midterms, I was kind of like, I had a C, and I got to get it up to a B. So if I don't study for this one, I'm in trouble. Knowing where you are, knowing what's important, is critical. And, and you know, my daughter who just went through that, I, mean, I give her a lot of credit. She she uh, found a couple things that she liked doing. She was very engaged, um, and, and she and, and rather than putting herself into a bunch of different things, she put herself into a couple of things. One related to her major, one that's at A&M is called Fish Camp, which is a freshman orientation program, and it's run by upper level students. Um, so she did that. She found what was she was interested in, and then she struck the balance, and she did well enough to, to get into law school. Right? And so, that's a, I don't know if that's your question, but it's, it's, it's something you got to be cognizant of. What other questions? Rob, I ram, rambled long enough for you. I, I think um, you've had a lot of successes, but maybe talk about some failures and less success. Would be interesting. Well, um, we, you know, I, I said I, I've never, never had a job that, that I didn't like, and and, uh, and that's that's very true. But not every job was perfect. Not every job worked out. You know, I, I mentioned that we took one through bankruptcy, and a lot of people wouldn't consider that a success. Now, along the way, we made a little bit of money when we took the company public. But even coming out of that bankruptcy, uh, you learned some things, and and. At that point in time, I was in a management role, and so some of the things I learned, if, if, you know, if, if all of us were in here, we're in a company, and, and I'm your leader, and we're a fast-growing company, and, and we're working hard, and it's, you know, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, and we've got long hours, we're serving our clients, and we're, we're really uh, making a difference for them, you know, it's part of my job to let you know that this is going to pay off, that, you know, yeah, you're working a lot this week, but, you know, next week's July 4th, we're going to get a couple days off. Uh, just let's push through this, and you know, I need, you need to be honest. I need to be open with you about why we're doing this, and and, and what will motivate you. And, and, and one of the things I learned is when we got into the other situation where, you know, it was it was a tough day on September 11th, and it was a tough day when Enron filed bankruptcy, and we knew we were out of there, and it became clear to everybody in the company that, that we were going to be in dire straits. You learned pretty quickly that the way you treated people and the values and the and those kinds of things that you treated on the, that you exercised on the way up when all the time were just as important on the way down. Because you guys all work for me and you wonder what the future is. Well, you go home, you've got spouses at home that wonder, are you still going to have health insurance if this company goes under? So I need to be honest with you about what we're doing and how you get covered and what. what. So, so 
you know, even coming out of those failures, uh, or that, that failure, we learned a lot about how to, to treat people, to, to take care of clients. Clients were worried at the time. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's an issue. Uh, when, on this drug that we just um, finished a phase two study on that, that did not work out to show the efficacy that we wanted, I mean, there are some people who say, well, that's a failure. And, and it's a disappointment because we spent, uh, in aggregate, we've spent almost $5 million to find out it doesn't work. And we don't really want to shut it down. Um, and so you start thinking about what's plan B. And um, one of the things you learn along the way is, is to, you know, deal with the adversity. And you can, you know, you can, I can curl up in a ball and get under my desk and just not come out and say, well, that drug's dead and we're not going to work it. You know, and, and I just not do anything. Or I can say, well, wait a minute, okay, here are the issues. It didn't work in this particular situation, but because of the way the drug functions, might it work in another situation, and could I get some interest in that? And, and I've done that. I've succeeded in going back to MD Anderson and getting their attention for another use of the drug. And these are skeptical people. They're, they're you know, doctors and PhDs that are trained to, to be skeptical, and I've been able to convince them that it's worth a shot. And so we're, we're, we're trying now to figure out how we salvage that situation. So, you know, even you know, coming out of the failures, we, we learn how to treat people, we learn how to find a plan B, and you also got to know when it's when it's done. I mean, it, it, you don't chase them as futile, but, but, but those things worked. And, and I'll tell you, along the way, uh, the second drug company I'm working now, I would not be in here if it really wasn't for the first. Uh, in, in my phone, uh, there, there are, there are 4,000 names in this phone from my contact database of people. I've made it a habit starting when you could first electronically keep records like that of, of recording everybody I meet and keeping their names. So Robin's name, Robin and I met through an introduction. So it, and it's only because I was in that drug company and I was working in that <coughs> space that a mutual friend of ours put us together so you guys are both in the drug space. The guy who introduced us did, knew nothing about the new company. He only knew about the old one. So even in that one that may one day get shut down, the lessons I learned, the contacts I made, um, figuring out how to decide what's important, all that kind of stuff plays into taking the next one forward. And um, you know, so there are a lot of lessons to be learned in those, and, and you just grow out of failure. It's, it's, you know, the old saying, so it's not saying goes, it's not how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get back up, and you just keep going. And if you get knocked down and stay down, because you give up easy, that's that's on you. Uh, there are a lot of people that help you if you, if you uh, uh, make the effort to get back up, and that's that's been you know the gratifying thing here. We had not quite, the same, but Rob and I talked briefly earlier. He's introduced me to three potential capital sources. Uh, you know, one of which I had a good long meeting with last Saturday, last Monday night. That would not have happened if it wasn't for networking and you know, him, even though I didn't have a great phase two, he still wanted to do that. So. Anything else? Great. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you. I, I wish you guys all the best of luck with your projects. It's, it's interesting. You're, you're uh, more involved in that.